Good afternoon, everyone. Okay, so the mic is on. <laughs> Good afternoon, and uh, welcome to um, Race and Space, a straight red line from housing segregation to communities in crisis. Uh, my name is Allison Bethel, and it's my pleasure to serve as your moderator this afternoon. Uh, just a few housekeeping matters. Please double check that your cell phones are off. Um, the uh, ACS Twitter handle is uh, at ACS Law, and the uh, convention's official hashtag is hashtag ACS 2017. That's hashtag ACS 2017. Uh, during the uh, Q&A, um, you can use uh, that microphone and just sort of make a, uh, you know, a line, um, and we'll be happy to answer your questions. Uh, I, I am thrilled to see everyone here and just a little bit surprised uh, that you're here on this lovely uh, Friday afternoon uh, in D.C. Uh, but you've chosen what I think is, is really going to be one of the most exciting panels uh, of this uh, conference, which is saying a lot because it, it's really been outstanding from my perspective so far. Uh, I uh, direct the uh, Fair Housing Legal Clinic at John Marshall Law School in, in Chicago. Uh, I've been practicing in housing discrimination law since about the early 90s. Uh, I actually started representing uh, housing providers. Um, I then uh, joined the Attorney General's office in Florida, uh, serving as the Director of Civil Rights, and in that capacity I did civil rights enforcement. And of course now I'm at John Marshall where we continue to do uh, housing uh, litigation cases federal court as well as state court and other venues. And I share this with you to say that I think I bring a little bit of a unique perspective to this uh, issue. And I've matured over the years. Um, I used to think, well, let's just sue all the bastards, right? <laughs> and solve it that way, you know, and have a lot of fun. Um, but as I've matured, uh, I've realized, uh, frankly, how uh, inefficient uh, the litigation system is. Um, and how complex this issue is, how deeply entrenched this issue is uh, in our community, such that we really need a multifaceted strategy in order to make progress on it. Uh, here we now, here we are now, almost 50 years, will be 50 years next year with the passage of the Fair Housing Act, and yet uh, NAFA, National Fair Housing Alliance, uh, reported uh, slightly over nearly 29,000 instances of housing discrimination. Our nation, all of the cities in our nation, for the most part, remain heavily segregated with uh, blacks and whites uh, uh, living separately uh, and apart, and perhaps never the twain shall meet. So what we're going to do today is talk a little bit about this problem, uh, really from how we started, uh, how we got to where we are. Uh, we're going to talk about some government um, policies that continue to perpetuate the housing discrimination and lack of uh, housing choice that we see today. Uh, we're going to then segue into talking a little bit about how this affects, uh, over, uh, how it affects our communities in terms of the criminal justice system, over policing of our communities and what that means. And then finally, we're going to uh, talk a little bit about uh, some um, potential solutions to the problem, some things for you to think about, and then we want to hear from you, uh, the real experts in it. But we do have a real distinguished panel, and I'm not going to read their, bi uh, their bios. It's there uh, in your uh, materials, but trust me when I tell you these are some big dogs uh, who have uh, written and taught on these subjects. Uh, and you're going to enjoy hearing from them. We're going to start with Richard. Richard's going to set us up, and then we're going to uh, move to uh, Ilya, who's going to talk about um, uh, some of the government policies I mentioned. Then we're going to jump down here to Justin. He's going to talk about the policing issues, and then we're going to move down to Cheryl, who's going to wrap us up. I am just going to apologize a little bit in advance because uh, I am going to be very, very strict on time. Uh, and I apologize if I offend anybody, but my goal here is to get, leave us enough time so that we can hear your questions. So with that, Richard. Thank you, Allison. Is this on? No. Here, use mine. Well, thank you, Allison, again. Um, as Allison said, uh, every metropolitan area in this country is racially segregated residentially. Uh, and um, 
it's the cause, residential racial segregation is the cause of some of the most serious social problems we face in this country. We would not have the police uh, community confrontations uh, if young African American men without hope were not concentrated in neighborhoods of low opportunity and if police uh, were not uh, able to treat entire neighborhoods as uh, places of occupation rather than as places to serve and protect. Uh, we would not have the kind of uh, enormous income inequality that we have in this country today uh, were it not in large part for residential segregation uh, where um, African American families typically, or not all, but African Americans typically are not gaining the kind of housing uh, wealth that white families get. And we would not have the stalled economic mobility that increasingly characterizes this society without residential segregation. We know, for example, that uh, uh, low-income families, uh, the children of low-income families who live in segregated neighborhoods are much less likely to have middle incomes, middle-class incomes when they're adults than children of the same low incomes who live in non-segregated neighborhoods. So residential segregation uh, is, is a, a fundamental problem for this society, uh, quite aside from the obvious uh, ways in which it separates us. We've not dealt with residential segregation in this country uh, in any way, any serious way, and m what I want to suggest to you is the reason we haven't is because we're hobbled by a myth that's shared across the political spectrum. It's uh, shared by conservatives as well as liberals, and that's a myth that the residential segregation that we experience is something we call de facto segregation, the result of private prejudice or personal choices or perhaps real estate steering or income differences, uh, none of them rising to the level of state action that would constitute de jure segregation. And what I want to show you in the few minutes that I have is that, in fact, the residential segregation in every metropolitan area in this country is the product of very, very explicit, racially conscious, explicit federal, state, and local policy that was designed to segregate the nation by race and the de facto characteristics are a minor part of it. So let me just give you a few examples of public housing. Many of us think of public housing as a place where low-income families, primarily minorities, live a very low income, unemployed, perhaps single families, uh, single parents. Um, in fact, public housing began uh, in the New Deal, uh, civilian public housing, and it was designed primarily for middle-class white families because there was a housing shortage. And the federal government across the country built segregated public housing in northern cities, in western cities, in midwestern cities, even in places that had never known segregation before or in integrated neighborhoods. Uh, I talk in my book about Langston Hughes, whose autobiography describes how he grew up in the neighborhood of Cleveland that was integrated. His best friend was Polish, he dated a Jewish girl, the Public Works Administration, one of the first New Deal agencies, demolished that neighborhood and built separate projects for African Americans and whites. And they did this everywhere in the country. In many cases, uh, segregating neighborhoods, as in Cleveland, that had never known segregation before. Uh, in World War II, uh, hundreds of thousands of defense workers flocked to centers of defense production, overwhelming uh, cities that couldn't accommodate that, that wave of uh, internal immigrants. The federal government had to build housing, and again, it built segregated public housing, creating patterns of segregation in cities that had never known it before. Um, in my book, uh, The Color of Law, focuses on Richmond, California, in part, because I figure if um, I can show that this happened in a liberal place like the Bay Area of San Francisco, it probably happened everywhere. Richmond, California grew during World War II from a population of less than 20,000 to over 100,000. There's no way the housing stock of that city could have accommodated the defense workers who flocked there. But the federal government, there were no very few African Americans living in Richmond at the time, a few domestic uh, servants, but uh, it was basically a white community. The federal government built separate housing for African Americans and whites, for African Americans along the railroad tracks near the shipyards, um, for whites, more sturdy construction uh, further inland, creating a segregated pattern and this went on uh, uh, throughout the San Francisco Bay Area as well as elsewhere in the country. By the um, mid-1950s, 
I'm skipping ahead now, by the mid-1950s, the um, uh, civilian housing shortage began to ease. During World War II, uh, well, I mentioned before, there was no civilian housing construction going on in the Depression, uh, which was one cause of the uh, need for public housing. During World War II and afterwards, uh, uh, construction materials were, were prohibited for civilian construction. They were reserved for the, the war effort. But by the mid-1950s, civilian housing construction began, and throughout the country, we saw a pattern where the white housing projects for middle-class whites had large vacancies, and the projects for African Americans had long waiting lists. And the reason for this was a second federal program run by the Federal Housing Administration, another New Deal agency that was established in 1934, to suburbanize the white population on as explicit a racial basis as the public housing program segregated public housing tenants. Uh, many people, I think, or many of you are probably familiar with the fact that the FHA would not insure mortgages for individual African Americans in um, white neighborhoods. But that was a minor part of the Federal Housing Administration's contribu contribution to residential segregation. The major role of the Federal Housing Administration in suburbanizing the country was its guarantee of bank loans to entire subdivision builders on condition that no homes be sold to African Americans. So for example, the best known, uh, uh, probably the best known of these is uh, Levittown, uh, east of New York City, um, but this went on all over the country. Levitt could never have, in the late 1940s, uh, assembled the capital to build 17,000 homes as he did, um, for which he yet had no buyers. The only way he got that capital was by taking his building specifications to the Federal Housing Administration, getting the, housing administ the Federal Housing Administration to guarantee his bank loans. And um, with, that, with those loans guaranteed, he uh, built the development. The Federal Housing Administration placed a condition on those loans that no homes be sold to African Americans. And it further placed the condition that every home in Levittown have a clause in its deed prohibiting resale to African Americans. And this was not just Levittown. Every metropolitan area in the country had Federal Housing Administration subsidies for uh, builders of entire subdivisions on condition that they be racially exclusive. So we had these two interacting federal policies. We had public housing, which increasingly segregated African Americans in urban areas because they were not permitted to move out of public housing into the suburbs that the federal government was creating, and the Federal Housing Administration policy to suburbanize the white population, and uh, this went on throughout the entire uh, suburbanization. There were many, many other federal, state, and local policies that were equally racially explicit. This is not the implicit result of um, uh, benign, otherwise benign policies, the unintended consequences, the disparate impact. This was explicit federal policy. Just as public housing projects were explicitly designated as either for whites or for blacks, the Federal Housing Administration's underwriting manual explicitly prohibited the insurance of homes in integrated neighborhoods. In one case, uh, a builder in Detroit uh, proposed to build a, a subdivision for uh, white families. The Federal Housing Administration required that builder to construct a six-foot cement wall separating his uh, proposed development from a nearby African-American neighborhood. And only once that wall was constructed would the Federal Housing Administration permit the construction or finance the construction to go forward. Uh, many, many other policies. Uh, uh, you all uh, uh, are familiar, uh, for example, with, um, uh, this is not to do with housing, but it, uh, I'll, I'll relate it in a second. You're all familiar with the Bob Jones case in the 1980s where the Internal Revenue Service prohibited uh, uh, a tax exemption for Bob Jones University because, it, uh, pro because the university prohibited interracial dating. Well, uh, I'm all for interracial dating. Cheryl is even more so. <laughs> but uh, um, it was trivial compared to the, uh, in comparison to the systematic granting of tax exemptions to institutions across the country throughout the 20th century that um, were leaders in the drive for residential segregation. Most of the restrictive covenants in uh, urban areas throughout the country 
were centered in local churches and synagogues. And uh, the, the, the Shelley v. Kramer, which you're probably familiar with, the 1948 case in which uh, the Supreme Court finally found that the restrictive covenants could not be enforced as to the eviction of African Americans. Uh, the, um, the White family that brought that case, its suit was financed by the Cote Brillante Presbyterian Church in, uh, uh, in St. Louis. So this was the University of Chicago. The University of Chicago, uh, Robert Hutchins, the president of the University of Chicago for uh, almost two decades, a uh, leading liberal educator, had an office in the office of the presidency, in the office of the general counsel's office, in the office of the presidency of the University of Chicago, whose role was to bring suit against uh, homeowners who sold homes to African Americans and have them evicted. This was not hidden activity, it was very explicit. The IRS's continued granting of tax exemptions uh, to, to these institutions, and all it would have taken was a denial of tax exemption to one or two nationwide, and the, the activities would have stopped. So um, there's a systematic pattern of federal, state, and local policy. I call it de jure segregation, not de facto segregation, but it's never been remedied. It's never been remedied because of, I think, because of this myth that we have that the government had nothing to do with it. Because if we believe that residential segregation was created by millions of private choices and individual actions, it's hard to figure out how you can get millions of pri private choices and individual actions to undo it. But if we understand generally that uh, the federal government created residential segregation in an unconstitutional fashion, then it's easier to begin to think of the fact that the government can undo what it did with equally aggressive policy. But we're not going to be able to consider those policies so long as we um, are hobbled by this myth of um, de facto segregation. So my purpose in, in, in writing the book I did and in, in um, contributing to this conversation is to try to help um, uh, establish a new consensus that we have de jure residential segregation across this country. It's never been remedied. And once we have that consensus, we can begin to consider together the policies that can be undertaken that would be quite aggressive and unthinkable politically today, but would be quite aggressive equally uh, of the match of the policies that uh, the federal, state, and local governments um, implemented in order to ensure residential segregation across the country. I'd like to start by thanking ACS for organizing this event and all of you for coming. It's certainly a very timely subject. Uh, this is my second year in a row speaking at the ACS convention, so I feel like I'm almost an ACS regular. Though in truth, uh, cards on the table, I'm in some ways the oppositional speaker. I'm a libertarian, not a progressive. I don't hide that. However, the issues that I'm going to talk about today are ones where actually there is a great deal of consensus among experts across ideological lines, and my hope is that we might be able to come together to push through some badly needed reforms in these two areas, the areas of zoning and of the use of eminent domain. Uh, so throughout American history, one of the ways in which people have uplifted themselves out of poverty, particularly the minority poor, but also whites as well, was through mobility. People moved to areas where there was better housing, better job opportunities, and so on. But a lot of data shows that over the last 30 to 40 years, mobility, particularly for the poor, has greatly declined. Uh, and that has trapped many people in failing communities, with failing, uh, with failing industries, with serious social problems like the opioid epidemic, for example, uh, and many others. There's a number of causes of this worrisome trend, but one of the big ones is the growth in restrictive zoning. Zoning regulations which make it difficult or impossible, or at the very least extremely costly, to build new housing uh, to meet demand. In addition to making housing extremely expensive, particularly for the minority poor, it also blocks those same people off from valuable job opportunities. The effect is so large that Edward Glazer of Harvard University, perhaps the leading expert on this subject, estimates that in a number of large cities, zoning adds some 50% to the cost of housing for the poor and the lower middle class. 
A recent study by the National Bureau of Economic Research finds that if we reduced zoning barriers in our, some of our largest cities, not to zero, but even to the level prevalent in the median city, we could increase GDP by 9.5% a truly enormous number, and most of the benefit, or at least the benefit would disproportionately go to the poor and the lower middle class, particularly to minority poor. To give you some idea, uh, Trump has been uh, criticized, rightly in my view recently, for overestimating likely economic growth by 1% per year, because experts know that even that difference is very large and important. Uh, when we're talking about a gain of 9.5%, we're talking about something where there's few, if any other policy changes we could adopt that would have the same enormous benefit. And this is actually an area where there is broad uh, consensus among experts across the political spectrum. Uh, what I've just said is supported by libertarian and conservative policy experts, but it's also most of it endorsed by Jason Furman, the chairman of uh, Barack Obama's Council of Economic Advisors. Uh, it's also endorsed by Paul Krugman, who wrote a column about this, one of the very few areas where Krugman and I happen to agree. Uh, so there's a lot of consensus on this. Uh, it's also the case that minorities would benefit enormously from this. Obviously, they in particular suffer from this. But in addition, the white working class would benefit as well. The problems of the white working class were certainly much talked about as a result of last year's election. This is actually an issue where the white working class and uh, poor and lower middle class minorities have a strong common interest. Experts are well aware of it. Sadly, most ordinary people, most political leaders, uh, uh, have ignored this issue uh, almost completely. Historically, restrictive zoning, as Richard suggested in his excellent presentation, was enacted at least in large part precisely for the purpose of keeping out minorities from uh, majority white neighborhoods. And for many years, uh, government officials made no bones about that. They often explicitly said that's her goal. Today, I think uh, this is rarely a conscious goal. Indeed, some of the most severe restrictions exist in generally blue progressive cities like San Francisco. Francisco in New York. I don't think the authorities in these cities, for the most part at least, are racist. I think rather the public there and many policymakers simply are unaware of this very uh, harmful negative side effect of their policies. But even though their intentions may well be good, the effects are often uh, truly terrible. Uh, there are several possible ways to approach this problem. The one that I advocate is to imitate the policies of the city of Houston, which simply does not have zoning at all. Doesn't mean they don't have any land use regulation. Uh, they still have public health regulations, for example, but it does mean they don't cordon off whole parts of the city as parts where you can't build new housing or can't build multifamily housing and the like. Uh, and as a result of their not having zoning, housing is much cheaper and more available in that city and also job opportunities for minorities are also better. Uh, a less radical alternative is to do what some other cities in the Southwest and also in the South have done, which is to just restrict zoning. Uh, one possible way of doing it is to uh, adopt a proposal developed by David Schweiker of Yale Law School to give cities a zoning budget, limiting the total amount of zoning that they're allowed to do, so hopefully they would only do the most valuable and desirable kinds. Uh, I think his proposal deserves uh, greater consideration. Uh, so as I said, this scenario, there's a pretty broad expert consensus. Uh, it is at the root of not just our housing segregation crisis and, our ha and housing costs, but also of uh, diminishing job opportunities for the minority poor and also for the white poor. But sadly, tragically, most of the public is unaware of it. Uh, and it's got almost no attention in the election, even though the problems of the minority poor and the white working class were otherwise much discussed. A similar story to the one that I just told about zoning can also be told about the use of eminent domain. Uh, and in fact, I do tell some of it in my recent book, The Grasping Hand, which focuses on the history of the use of takings. Uh, from beginning in the mid 20th century and dragging on for several decades, uh, we use urban renewal and blight and economic development takings to forcibly displace as many as several million people, the vast majority of them poor minorities. Uh, indeed, the famous African-American writer James Baldwin called urban renewal takings Negro removal because that's what they were actually doing. 
in recent decades, the scale of this sort of activity has not been as great as before. However, it still goes on to a significant degree in uh, a good many jurisdictions, and it still does disproportionately in a negative way affect the minority poor. On the other hand, when the property is condemned and transferred to developers, uh, it is usually transferred to politically influential uh, development interests and uh, the wealthy uh, Donald Trump is an example of the sort of politically influential developer who has benefited from this. He was involved in several cases like this, uh, including a very famous one in New Jersey, but obviously there are many uh, other examples as well. It's also worth noting that in addition to forcibly displacing people and contributing to segregation, these sorts of takings also tend to destroy more economic value than they create. One of the major findings of modern development economics is that secure property rights are important to development both directly and indirectly because they prevent the destruction of uh, valuable community ties. Uh, this issue was uh, highlighted for the general public to some degree 12 years ago when the Supreme Court decided the Kilo case where they ruled that it was permissible to condemn property and transfer it to a new private owner simply on the basis that the new owner might produce more economic development, even though in that particular instance no development was actually produced except for some space that is now currently used by a colony of feral cats who have taken over the site and uh, have been using it. Uh, and as a result of this de uh, decision, there is a massive cross-ideological backlash, which I discuss at some length in my book. This was an area where the NAACP, Rush Limbaugh, Ralph Nader, and even Bernie Sanders were all on the same side. Doesn't happen too often. Uh, and uh, some 45 states passed eminent domain reform laws, about half of which I think actually do provide some real protection to people against these sorts of takings, but there's many other which sadly are mostly for show. Uh, I think much more progress can be made in this area. In my view, the best thing to, would be to overrule the Kilo decision and also the previous Berman versus Parker decision on which Kilo is based. But even short of that, there's much that can be done at both the federal and the state level uh, to address this. And I'm happy to talk about the uh, details. I do, in fact, discuss them in my book. So I think the bottom line is this. In both the areas of zoning and the area of eminent domain, there's an enormous amount that we can do to open open up new housing and employment opportunities for the minority poor, while also simultaneously benefiting the white poor, and in a way that doesn't require the government to try to engage in any kind of racial classifications or to try to decide how many people of which race should live in a particular area. Uh, I think doing these things probably would diminish significantly the amount of racial segregation that we have, but even if it did not, it would at least open up enormous new opportunities for the poor of all races, uh, and I think that's a goal worth striving for. Thank you. So uh, thanks for inviting me here. It's, it's, um, it's been almost three years since uh, Mike Brown was killed in August of 2014, and we'll probably be talking about it for three decades. Uh, but the question uh, that people ask me as someone who was uh, there during the protests was, why Ferguson? Why, out of all the places in the country, was Ferguson the place where this tinder tinderbox seemed uh, prepared to explode? And I think uh, to answer that question, you have to understand the structural aspects of racism. And I think when you talk about issues involving race and space, I think this is the most efficient way to understand and come to a clearer understanding of what we mean when we say structural racism. And so what I want to do in, in my short presentation is to help us understand what happened in Ferguson from that lens and secondly, to determine whether or not this understanding gives us a new perspective on what sorts of remedies we might want to seek. So there's an article called A Walk Down West Florissant Avenue, Ferguson, Missouri, uh, by a sociologist named Walter Johnson at Harvard, uh, which I take to be the definitive narrative on the case of Mike Brown. The inevitability of Mike Brown's killing doesn't actually originate in the point of contact between him and Darren Wilson. 
any more than the inevitability of disease in black communities that leaves us with a lifespan of around 70 years, uh, significantly shorter than the lifespan of others in this country, uh, originates with the contact between blacks and the hospital bed. Uh, this would ignore the food desert that is Ferguson. When Mike Brown went to the corner store earlier that day, that was the closest uh, location for healthy food or semi-healthy food that he had for miles because of the decision by Schnucks, the local uh, food producer, not to have a, uh, a, a large amount of access to healthy food in Mike Brown's community. Uh, that would ignore the school he attended, Normandy, uh, a school that was segregated in the truest sense of the, of the word with over 95% of its students being African American, a school that lost its accreditation uh, just a few days before Mike Brown himself was killed. Uh, that would ignore the economic development plan in Ferguson, um, which um, pretty much pursued the same economic development plan that local communities throughout the country use, which is to attract big business through tax breaks, uh, full stop. There's no other economic development plan that we've come up with, and as a result of these companies taking up acres of space and having tax breaks so that th so they're not uh, uh, providing any sort of resources or revenue for a school like Normandy, Normandy, you see the already segregated community with an already low tax base continuing to be stripped of its wealth. And so uh, St. Louis is a region which by any measure is unto today uh, in one of the top 10 most segregated cities in America. And so um, Colin Gordon in his, his book, Mapping Decline, St. Louis and the Fate of the American City, tells us the story of how that happened. So as recently as 1970, St. Louis was actually 99% white, 99%. And by 2014, it was 65% black. So this, this phenomenon we, we're calling the suburban ghetto uh, is a phenomenon that is sweeping the country. And in that process, what we're seeing is that public goods are being degraded in these formerly suburban neighborhoods. Uh, uh, public goods like food access, education, in a place like Flint, even access to clean water, these public goods are at risk. And finally, it comes to the, the public good that we're going to talk about um, for decades to come, the public good of policing. And so the Fourth Amendment also becomes eviscerated in the suburban ghetto. Um, in a place like Ferguson, we saw that uh, the local city government, although they were uh, as I said before, not in a place where they had a rich tax base, they somehow found a way to buy 60 new handguns in 2014. One of them was used to kill Mike Brown. Uh, they found a way to buy uh, new Chevrolet Tahoes for their police officers, one of which was driven by Darren Wilson when he cut off Mike Brown for walking in the street. And so we know policing gets the investment in these local communities, even when they're cash-strapped. Why does policing get the investment? Well, we saw in Ferguson, the reason was that policing was the mode of profit in the city. So I don't have to retell the Ferguson report story to you. But across this country, we're seeing that in the, the dearth, when these communities that have a dearth of a, a vibrant tax base, you're seeing policing being put forward as another way to replenish that tax base. So there's a direct line that you can draw from segregated housing, low uh, local tax bases, um, and policing being used to fill that gap and increased mass incarceration. So there's a, a line that you can draw which helps us to understand the story that is structural racism. Uh, so in that story, uh, as I said earlier, you're seeing spaces become degraded as they become blacker. That is not something that has to happen. That's not a necessity. There's the, the connection between the ghetto and the term of uh, ghettoization as a pejorative, as a, as a racial term. It's another ability or it's another opportunity to be racist without using the term race. Even today, if you call someone ghetto, 
You're, you're using a term that has connotations of their personal characteristics, lazy, unintelligent, slovenly. So we've found a way to connect race and space, locations, neighborhoods, and, and personality characteristics so that when you say bad neighborhood, when you say ghetto, uh, these are things that lead folks to come to racial conclusions. On the way over here, actually, I was driven by an Uber driver um, who is um, renting a house in Ward 7, and she was complaining about how her landlord um, was refusing to treat her with respect, was uh, being disrespectful to her, wasn't helping with the utilities in the way that he agreed to do so. And she was saying, well, I pay my money just like everybody else. My money is green, just like everybody else's money. What do I have to do to get respect? What do I have to do to get respect? But being considered ghetto, being considered a citizen of a space that's been racialized will withdraw respect from you, and so you lose this respect. That's one of the things that we've lost in communities like Ferguson, and it is something that translates all across the country. Uh, the last thing I want to mention is that when we use this lens of extraction as opposed to a lens of segregation versus integration, it changes the way we think of the problem. If the problem is segregation, it seems like the best solution is going to be integration. If the problem is extraction, extraction of dignity, extraction of wealth, we know homes are the primary generators of wealth in this country. When the FHA excluded African Americans from suburban homes, they were excluding African Americans from wealth. They weren't excluding them from neighborhoods. When they created the suburbs through the FHA, they were generating wealth for white communities and not generating wealth for black communities. So, so it's, a, it's a wealth creation question, not a per se segregation and integration question in my view. And if you use that lens, that changes your response. When we think about reparations, for example, it sounds like an outlandish idea. However, if you have a lens that says wealth was created for one segment of the community and not another, throughout the 20th century, why don't we flip it in the 21st century and create wealth for one segment of the community and not another? The average um, uh, wealth gap today, the average black family has about 11,000 in wealth, average white family has over 100,000. It's a huge gap and it was created through government action. I think the, the feeling that this was created through merit or through hard work or through education is a misunderstanding of the history of the 20th century. Um, so there are a number of scholars that have discussed some of these issues. Uh, Cheryl Harris, a professor at UCLA, has described the idea of whiteness as property. And you can think about how property was created for certain communities throughout the 20th century and the 19th century and the 18th century. There's a direct line there. Peggy McIntosh has uh, developed a theory of white privilege which includes this understanding that there's an invisible knapsack of rights and privileges that go along with race in America. And these property rights included the right to be a member of the suburban community in uh, uh, the 20th century, which was created by the FHA. So there are a number of different uh, scholars who are taking this more, um, I would say, more forward-looking understanding of race very seriously as it pertains to space. And it, this pertains to commercial development, this pertains to education, this pertains to housing, and it also, at the end of the day, pertains to the policing crisis that we saw culminate in the killing of Mike Brown. Thank you. Thank you so much. Cheryl. So before I begin, there are people standing at the back, and there are four, five seats open. If you'd like to come in and sit down, I'll give you a second. Just come on in, sit down. Um, let you get settled. This is not part of my time. Just no, no, give no. you 30 seconds. <laughs> That's fine. I thought they were law students who like to be in the back. That's the way they are in my class. <laughs> Me too. Me too. Back benchers. Okay. And there are a few more chairs up here. Okay, so um, thank you so much for coming. This is a very exciting panel and I feel honored to be a part of it. Um, 
I, I, I want to begin with Gunnar Myrtle in his classic treatise on American race relations and American di dilemma. In that book, he argued that the central animating rationale for the regime of Jim Crow segregation was the fear of black men having sex with white women. Um, Richard gave us a, a, a very good um, short history of 20th century segregation, but he didn't talk about the rationale, the ideology. Uh, and um, the ideology of white supremacy uh, animated not only Jim Crow segregation laws, but obviously anti-miscegenation laws. We've, we've been at se uh, segregation from the 1660s forward, but it also animated eugenics laws, authorizing state, state enforced sterilization of undesired populations. It animated the immigration laws of 1924 that banned or severely restricted immigration for all na nationalities except pale people from Northern Europe. And Village of Euclid, the Ambler Realty, which all property scholars you know, teach, um, all law students who take in property uh, read, I hope, uh, was decided in, in the 1920s, or around this time of, uh, it was a nasty time in, in race relations in this country, um, race riots all over the country, and this idea of, of, of supremacy um, is in the air. Um, and th that's the context in which the Supreme Court endorses Euclidean zoning and the idea of certain uses of land, even duplexes being parasitic on single family homes and, and frankly the subtext of that decision is parasitic on a certain kind of family, mm. a white middle class uh, family. Uh, the, and, and we live with that ideology to this day. Um, we still have not put it to bed and obviously it was white supremacy and the alt-right and all these n nasty ideas were a subtext of our recent election. Um, so we live not just with the architecture de facto segregation, but 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 an ideology and a and, and a and a specter of fear of the other. Um, I won't go into the consequences for opportunity of of, of living in a segregated nation. I, I don't have time for that. But I will say that w what's been going on, um, not just along racial dimensions, but also along class dimensions. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, since 1970, we've had a spike in economic segregation, um, and, and what we've got is um, college-educated uh, economic elites um, are more isolated in their own neighborhoods and metropolitan regions than even black people, and what we have is, there's a very interesting new book in addition to, 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 to Richard's very interesting book. Um, out there, it's called Dream Hoarders, you know, and he paints this picture, uh, a, a guy named Richard, I can't remember his last name, he's at Brookings, he paints this picture of the top 20% in their own neighborhoods. We've got direct horizontal com competition for scarce resources between segregated elites and everybody else, and obviously the black and Latino poor, um, or anybody who can't, who, who's relegated to, to a neighborhood that you might call a ghetto, as, as, as Justin talked about, gets the worst deal, but frankly, um, the, the American dream isn't working for anybody who can't buy their way into uh, a, a high opportunity neighborhood. And there's a lot of evidence that shows not only does this segregation um, contribute to overinvestment in, in, in poverty-free neighborhoods um, and disinvestment elsewhere, it also contributes to othering, particularly, and Justin spoke of this, particularly of the people who are stuck in high poverty segregated neighborhoods. Um, so my remaining time, I'd like to um, reflect on or think about, talk about what we can do to transcend the fear and othering, particularly of black bodies, that, that, that is, is part of the subtext of, of what makes fair housing uh, so hard. Anybody in this room who's worked on fair housing, you know, it's, it's, it's really, really hard. Um, and some of it has to do with um, you know, whites themselves. Um, Justin talked about um, um, the scholarship around whiteness as a property right and white privilege, but if you haven't read um, Robin D'Angelo's piece, White Fragility, 
I would encourage you to read that piece. Basically, um, she talks about the effects of segregation. The average white, white, average white person li in this country um, lives in an overwhelmingly white neighborhood. 76% um, well, the average white person lives in a neighborhood that is 76% white. Well, what that does, most white people are used to the racial comfort of an overwhelmingly white neighborhood. Um, and recent research shows that um, uh, when a neighborhood gets to 15% blackness, uh, for whatever reason, whether orchestrated <coughs> or, 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 or not, um, um, that's when you begin to get white avoidance. And, and why is that? Um, um, I think it's important to, to bring it out into the open. You know, why is there fear of black people? Black people are the people that all the studies show people are most um, um, uh, resistant to integrating with. Um, and I'm gonna speculate. I'm speculating in some writing I'm doing now. Um, I, I think that there's a modern stereotype. I mean, the, in, in the old days, the stereotype of the black male sexual predator predator helped justify the old Jim Crow. I believe this modern stereotype, which Justin alluded to, of the ghetto dweller or ghetto thug is part of the, and I say it's a stereotype, um, uh, is part of the spoken or unspoken uh, subtext of fair housing debates. There's a spatial dimension to anti-black stereotyping that goes beyond class. Um, and you know, we all have in our heads an association when we hear the word ghetto. Um, and some of it is, 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 is glorified in gangster rap. Some of it is, comes from the near constant news stories about urban crime. But I think this is a sticky stereotype that may explain widespread fear, particularly of black males. Um, well, um, and, and, and you know, I'm, I'm doing some research now about the relatively small a really relatively small number of census tracts in this country that might qualify to be a ghetto neighborhood. Um, uh, these, this is a small number of census tracts, but they loom large in American race relations uh, in terms of, uh, and, and uh, you know, in addition, it's interesting, it contributes to the fear and othering and disrespect of, of, of people stuck in low income, high poverty black neighborhoods. Um, and, and sometimes it's middle and upper class black people who are participating in the othering. Um, and I think this is a bit of what James Foreman's new book is about. Even in Washington, D.C., where Democrats outnumber Republicans by 12 to 1, uh, where African Americans for many years were controlled government, uh, political leaders pursued punitive laws that fueled mass incarceration and filled the prisons in this city with black men. And that same black political leadership was also slow to adopt an inclusionary zoning ordinance and has pursued policies that displace many poor residents in the city. Um, so uh, in the two minutes I have remaining, I think it's about two minutes, mm. um, how can we transcend this fear? Um, I mean, anybody who's worked on housing can, can point to really good public policies uh, including um, um, inclusionary zoning, about five to ten percent of jurisdictions, about 400 counties or 400 jurisdictions in this country have an inclusionary zoning ordinance uh, that promotes um, um, fair housing. Um, how can we create a political context in which more communities uh, have the political will to pursue um, these kinds of policies? Um, I, I the, the one thing that gives me some hope in this country, and I, I write about this um, in my new book, Shameless, Shameless, in my father's <laughs> <laughs> um, I have two copies to give away when the, when the panel's over. Um, but there is an emerging, uh, what I call culturally dexterous person. Um, a culturally dexterous white person um, Ha, tends to, has a, a, a an intimate experience with a non-white person. There's recent research that shows that a white person who has a black friend, um, you can predict that if you have a, if a white person, with, I'm talking about an authentic friendship. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right.
right? Um, that a friendship, a white person with a black friend, it's, it raises the probability that they will have empathy for black people, it raises the probability that they will be angry about how black people are treated, and it raises the probability that they will engage in collective action for fairer, saner policies. Um, and I believe that rising interracial intimacy combined with other forces, I'm not staking my claim solely on interracial uh, marriage, sex, or whatever, right? But rising interracial intimacy combined with immigration, demographic change, generational replacement, the dying off of older whites who grew up expecting to be dominant in this country, and increasing geographic diversity. Um, it's in, in dense metropolitan areas, increasingly it's very difficult to escape difference. Um, and uh, I try to, uh, in the final chapter in this book and, and in some new writing I'm working on, offer a vision that's different from mere gentrification and mere pushing out of people, but a vision for the new kinds of civic institutions and multiracial coalitions and organizations that, that we ought to be creating that create new norms of inclusion in, in these spaces and um, that fights for the right kind of policies uh, to correct the de facto segregation that Richard has described. Thank you. Thank you. I told you it was good. Okay, we're ready for your questions. Um, you know, as you make your way up to the mic, I just wanna say really, <clears throat> as a soldier in the trenches, one of the things I see at the Prax and the Fair Housing Clinic that makes it so challenging is that people no longer say, we don't want black people, we don't want this, we don't want that. They say, you know, we don't want someone on section eight, which is, Code. you yeah, for welfare mom. They say, I was telling our, our law student that one of my cases, um, the rental application uh, said uh, you cannot have been convicted of a crime in the last 100 years. <laughs> so instead of just saying we don't take ex-offenders, disproportionate numbers of which, of course, are persons of color, black males, uh, persons even with disabilities, uh, we have these, these games they're playing. Your question. Yeah, um, the last speaker um, mentioned gentrification. Um, so how do you, what policies specifically can you adopt that would take all of the benefits, get all the benefits of gentrification and none of the bad stuff? Ooh. Well, I don't profess to be an expert on the policies. What I've spent the last five years researching is race relations itself, mm -hmm. because I'm frustrated at us not, move, you know, not moving behind, beyond the political gridlock that racial division is, 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 is part of. Um, I think, um, you know, um, having affordable housing trust funds and having policies in place to fight against the um, um, dis, uh, destruction and replacement of the affordable housing yeah. stock and having an inclusionary zoning ordinance is part of the answer. I also think that there need to be more um, uh, coalitions or civic institutions that are explicitly dealing with the fear, where you can get, get you know, uh, 50, 100, 1,000 people to show up at the, at the zoning meeting where they're considering voting on an inclusionary zoning ordinance and standing there and saying, we want to be an inclusive place. We do not fear, we, we support Hope Six. Um, but I don't profess to be a, 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 an expert on, on, on the and gentrification then, uh, tool. Richard have comments on that. Yeah. So uh, I do actually study housing and land use policy. I don't think there's a completely cost-free way to approach this, but one way that's relatively low cost for the huge benefits is to reduce the zoning barriers which currently create an artificial shortage of housing stock, particularly in many large urban areas, New York, San Francisco, and others. That way, the fact that a neighborhood is gentrifying and uh, land values might be increasing in that neighborhood, that doesn't mean that the poor people who live there have nowhere to go and must leave the metro area entirely. There would be opportunities to build new housing 
elsewhere in the area, and indeed, uh, industry would have an incentive to do that building uh, because of zoning restrictions. Uh, that incentive is cut off and is actively prevented. So uh, I think gentrification would be less of a problem and there would be fewer complaints about it if it were not the case that it's so hard in many cities to uh, get permission to build housing for uh, lower income people such that if gentrification occurs, then the people who previously lived there uh, often have nowhere to go except to leave the metro area entirely. But, but you're still destroying Uh, to some extent, but notice that if they can move to somewhere that's relatively nearby in the same metro area, then the destruction of social ties can be greatly diminished. Yeah. Let's keep covering this. Yeah. Yeah, you know, um, it's, it's not going to be an easy uh, a solution, but, but I do think that what he's saying about zoning is, is huge. I, I had a case which, which, you know, we lost, but... Uh, it, it was it was against a village where we, we were trying to basically build an affordable uh, housing development and we needed uh, a number of variances uh, from setback rules and parking rules and these sorts of things and the community hid behind these you know well we love our parks we love our green space we love all of this uh, and the case was uh, we wound up losing the case but but fast forward a few years later, through some aggressive grassroots advocacy, uh, a few years later, the development got approved. Now, there had been a change in the city council and, and, and all such as that, uh, but through time, I think we can make some, some changes. Good afternoon. I first want to thank, uh, start by thanking all of our distinguished panelists. My name is Brandon Welch. I'm a current student at the George Mason University School of Law. Uh, and I just want to say that this has been an eye-opening way to look at the issues around public housing authorities, land use, eminent domain, and how all of these are not individualized silos that we tend to group them into, but have such an interplay and such a positive feedback for the worse, not the better, and the fact that there needs to be something done to break that. So as much as I, I admire some of the proposed solutions, I'm a pragmatist to some extent, yeah. and knowing the administration we have right now and the world we live in, one of the arguments, um, thanks for bringing up Kila, whoever, I can't remember which one of the panelists brought up Kila, that was flashbacks. I've, I've written um, a book about it even. Uh, <laughs> uh, one of the hardest arguments I've had with people who don't necessarily see these issues as clearly as I think most of the people in this room would, is that well, if you don't like being discriminated against in area X, Y, Z, just get up and move. And I believe Professor Solman actually mentioned that mobility actually has decreased for the poorest people over the last three years significantly. And one of my questions is, how do we address that mobility and how do we incorporate that conversation with people who don't necessarily understand that you can't just get up and move? Like that's Maybe for me, that's something that I can get up and do. If I really wanted to, I could get up and move tomorrow because I have that privilege. But a lot of people that are the most affected by these policies can't get up and move to a area with better opportunities. And that's what it's gonna take, it sounds like, to do this. So how do I have that conversation and show them that that mobility isn't there? So always glad to see one of our own students from GMU. Uh, more something we have. I have, in fact, written a book about the Kilo case, the grasping hand. In terms of mobility, I think there's a lot that can be done to increase the opportunities for it. Uh, I mentioned before reducing zoning. Another is reducing licensing. Uh, to, according to Brookings Institution, some 30% of American workers now have to have licenses to their jobs, including such people as florists and tour guides and others. And that, of course, because the licenses are on a state-by-state -state basis, that diminishes mobility. And there's quite a lot of things uh, like that, many other policies like that, that can be changed. In terms of the conversation, it obviously depends on who you're having a conversation with and what their viewpoint is. I think it's not quite true to say that there's no opportunity to move. There still is, and there's a good deal of mobility. But it is important to recognize that there's a part of our population where the mobility is much less than it should be. And so uh, I think 
it's a part of American history and American tradition that people can better their lives through mobility, uh, but we need to do more to break down the barriers to that. Uh, and if you want to explain that to a non-expert, you can say something like, well, imagine that you're trapped in a failing community and the places where there are jobs that would improve your life, you can't go there because <laughs> the government has barred you from coming in. And so uh, it's important to recognize, on the one hand, that people do have some obligation to work to better their lives, uh, but on the other hand, the rest of us, at the very least, have an obligation not to get in their way. Uh, and if we are, in fact, getting in their way, or if the government is, then we should look at that and do more to prevent it. And I think uh, that's a message. I'm not an expert on political messaging, though I have written about political ignorance, but uh, I would say that that's a point that can be gotten across even to people who are not experts in this particular field and are not going to you know, read reports by economists or whatnot. Richard, what do you think? Yeah. Well, I want to elaborate a little bit on what yeah. Ilya said because I, I agree uh, with what he said, but I think it needs to be put in a broader context, as I was saying earlier. This history that I was describing was once well known. This is not, uh, it, it, you know, the subtitle of my book is A Forgotten History of How Our Government Segregated America. In 1968, Richard Nixon was elected president and he appointed as his Secretary of Housing and Urban Development a fellow named George Romney, um, uh, who has the same name as a, a recent presidential candidate. And George Romney said, this was a Republican HUD secretary, he announced that the federal government, in the ways I had described earlier, has created a white noose around uh, African American communities, and it's the federal government's obligation to untie that noose. And George Romney proposed a program and implemented a program called Open Communities, in which he required subdivisions, suburbs, as a condition of getting federal funds for all the things that the federal government gives money for, for sidewalks and sewers and green space and all the other things. Uh, as a condition of getting federal funds, they had to repeal their exclusionary zoning ordinances uh, in order to permit moderate low-income families from moving into uh, middle-class suburbs. And he actually withheld funds from three suburbs, from Baltimore County, and he was supported in that by Spiro Agnew, the vice president, because Spiro Agnew had been a county executive there and had been fighting with, with local communities about the, the, the extent to which they were creating uh, problems in central, in central Baltimore by refusing to allow people to move there. He, he withheld funds from Baltimore County, he withheld funds from Warren, Michigan, and he withheld fun, funds from an area near Cleveland. And there was a backlash, and uh, Spiro Agnew didn't win the fight, and uh, neither did George Romney, and he was eventually forced out as Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, the Open Communities um, uh, Plan was canceled. But we got close, and I think it could happen again. Um, I am, you know, I'm all in favor of gentrification. Gentrification should happen everywhere. All communities should have a mix of, of uh, low, moderate, and, and middle-income housing. And the big problem, which we haven't mentioned with the gentrification, is that when the families who, we need inclusionary zoning to permit some families to remain, but that doesn't uh, avoid the fact that most families are going to leave if there's a gentrified community. And the problem is today that they leave to newly segregated inner ring suburbs like Ferguson. Uh, and so we're just displacing the segregation from one um, area to another because most suburbs, unlike Ferguson, don't permit uh, a, variety of, a variety of housing. And, and let me just so I can say one thing. There are two federal programs today uh, for, that subsidize low-income housing, and both of them reinforce segregation. And those could be uh, uh, reformed easily in an administration that wanted to, and if we had the kind of understanding of these issues that we need. One is the Low Income Housing Tax Credit Program, which was a very important, uh, played a very important role in creating a segregated community in, um, in Ferguson. And the reason it promotes segregation is because most developers use their low income housing tax credits to build in segregated communities, because that's where the land is cheapest, and that's where there's no community opposition, and that's where you can put up a for rent sign and the potential renters will see it. And we could very easily reform that program to prohibit the construction of, or limit the construction of, of, low, income, of, of low income housing tax credit developments in already segregated communities. 
The other is the Section 8 housing voucher program, with which you're all familiar with. And again, that contributed to the segregation of Ferguson, because throughout the St. Louis area, landlords in middle class communities refused to accept Section 8 vouchers, as, as you were describing. And we could prohibit discrimination against Section 8 voucher holders, and in combination with reform of zoning rules and, and uh, requirement that low-income housing tax credit developments build, be built throughout metropolitan areas, we could encourage the mobility of Section 8 housing voucher recipients throughout the metropolitan area. So there are short-term reforms we can do without you know, the major things that will be needed to address segregation overall. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's right. I'm Great finished. question. Uh, I just would also add um, the uh, Supreme Court, the Supremes decided um, inclusive communities in 2015, which dealt with this issue that he's talking about, the siting of, um, of public housing and the use of low-income uh, tax credits. And, and the good and the bad news is, you know, they still have a problem there and they're still working on that. But the good news is that the Supreme Court came out reaffirming the use of the Fair Housing Act for these more subtle uh, discriminatory practices, such as the, the, the siting of, of public housing. And yes, we need source of income discrimination, but as a litigator, I mean, I'm telling you, I work with these, these laws in the city of Chicago, we need to look at you know, how to improve that because just having source of income as a protected class alone is not going to solve the problem if they don't have a place to go. Uh, so when they try in Chicago to go out to the outlining areas where source of income is not protected, the landlord says, no, we don't take vouchers, we're not going to have vouchers, so they wind up coming back to the city of Chicago in the same areas that they started with. Thank you so much for your question. Yes, thank you Next gentleman. Much. Yes, sir. Oh, wow. You guys are great. We've got to shorten our answers, guys, so we can get in all these questions. You know, when you give a lawyer a mic, what do you want? <laughs> they knew that. Um, hi, my name is Taru, and I'm a, uh, I'll be a three, a third year law student at Case Western in Cleveland. Yeah, congratulations. And uh, thanks. And so my question uh, is about, um, so often white flight is, is sort of focused on as a contributing factor to the deterioration of many uh, communities. Um, but I'm just wondering your thoughts on black bourgeois flight. And um, so for example, Eugene Robinson, uh, former columnist for the Washington Post, has written about uh, this issue and that one of the problems with the civil rights movement and its successes is that um, black professionals and black upper, upper middle class have benefited. But um, because of increased mobility amongst that class, and blacks integrating into uh, white communities and such, that that's left behind sort of, um, you know, the proletarian kind of um, black uh, working class. And, and so I'm just wondering about your thoughts on uh, the responsibility of black professionals as far as having a critical mass in black communities such as Ferguson um, and black communities across the country. Um, so what about the responsibilities of um, affluent blacks living in these communities and such. Who are you calling bourgeois? <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't resist that. I'll, I'll just say, I'm curious what Justin thinks about this question, but uh, I'll be very quick. Uh, economic segregation is rising fastest among blacks and Latinos. Black and Latino one percenters are moving to opportunity too. Um, and, you know, it's a dilemma. It's a dilemma. I personally um, had per purposely chose to live in Shepherd Park in a neighborhood where there were black people and within walking distance from my house there's subsidized housing. I purposely, you know, took my kids out of an elite private school and, and, and you know, I'm in, in a public charter school. It's a charter school, but it acts like a magnet school where uh, a quarter of the kids are on free and reduced lunch. I want my children to be able to relate to uh, uh, people of all kinds. Um, so I hope I'm walking the walk. But you're, what, what, you, what you talk about is real. Justin. Mm. <laughs> the hardest question of the moment. <laughs> um, well, there, there's a, another a book called um, From Black Lives Matter to Black Liberation by Kianga Taylor. And uh, she 
in that book describes the class divide within the black community as a crisis because income inequality is even higher in the black community than it is in America writ large. Mm -hmm. And so it, it calls into question this idea of a shared fate and responsibility for all aspects of the community. Um, and there's a book, there's a, I can't remember the scholar's name, but there's a book called Black Picket Fences or something. There's a, it's, it's a, there's a long history of understanding that in the past, um, one complaint has been for the black middle class, uh, their ability to engage in social mobility was limited um, when they could not uh, exclude or separate themselves from the poor in the same way that whites could because of their limited options in terms of housing. Hmm. And we know that value follows space and distance from uh, what is seen as a negative element. So they weren't, so the black dollar and the black ability to build equity was shrunk by nature of this uh, inability to exclude. And that's, you know, when we think about property, you're thinking about one of the key aspects of that being the right to exclude. So, you know, another, another more radical way to perhaps try to think about this question is to question, is to, to revisit the way we think about property itself. If, if if we can think about property as, as a question of responsibility to um, be a steward of resources as opposed to the right to exclude others from resources, for example, uh, then you may think about community in a different way, and then you may think about approaching a difficult problem like that in a different way. But as it's currently structured with income inequality and wealth inequality, uh, more of a crisis in the black community than it is in America writ large, you're seeing the sort of the ripping apart of the idea of black solidarity on those types of questions. Great question. Yes, sir. Yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Daniel Noronha. I'm a recent graduate from Tulane University. Congratulations. In uh, my question is regarding environmental justice. So how can environmental justice and environmental litigation serve as a tool to um, to desegregate these these neighborhoods and uh, for example examples like Flint, Michigan or Newark, New Jersey, where we have seen that grassroots organizations have taken like uh, have taken the lead in this type of battles or h how can there be other type of like mechanism through environmental litigation to de to, to desegregate these neighborhoods because in in the end I think all of these uh, all of these issues are connected somehow. Oh, yeah. Sue them. <laughs> so in some cases, it may indeed be desirable to sue, but one of the big findings of modern social science is that environmental quality increases as economic growth increases and income increases. That is, the wealthier uh, people are, the more they're willing to devote some of those resources to keeping up environmental quality. Uh, this is observed both within particular neighborhoods in the U.S., but also internationally. So if we want people to live in cleaner areas and also to be willing to devote more resources to uh, environmental quality, uh, what we want to do is increase their economic growth and economic opportunities. And in the long run, I think that can make a much bigger impact on environmental quality, particularly for the poor, than uh, even the best possible litigation. Uh, you know, I had an interesting situation uh, when I was with the Attorney General's office. Um, there was a community that was going to pass a noise ordinance that would, would limit the, you know, noise from the airport and such. This was in, in um, southwest Florida. And, but they were carving out an exception for Immokalee, which is a, a, a black area. Uh, in, in that community. And anyway, we got wind of this. The Attorney General got wind of this. And um, what we did was um, uh, the Attorney General issued, um, which was Bob Butterworth at the time, issued an Attorney General opinion. And now AG opinions are not, you know, they're not like really, they're not actually law, but they're very persuasive authority. And uh, he basically uh, issued, opined that this would, would not be a good thing to do, that it would, would be, you know, discriminatory, disastrous to health, yada, yada, yada. And guess what happened? The ordinance got killed. 
didn't pass, it got tabled. So I just share this to say that sometimes some of these issues that you're talking about, yes, we can't sue them all, but sometimes working, you know, kind of creatively with your local governments and, and such that are, are uh, you know, supportive of your views, you can come up with something uh, a little more creative, a little more different that might help you with the problem. summer there's there's a lot of reasons for a lot of the zoning that we have and for other barriers to development like environmental rules um, we want to plan our communities so that they work well with transit so how do you protect the legitimate interests of the government in deciding how cities are developed while also making it easier for developers to build new housing and then another sort of related question that I have is when I hear discussions of affordable housing, usually it's about building more densely, but when you build more densely, the kinds of developments you're building are generally not for sale, they're for rent. And so much of the white middle class's wealth was built on home ownership. So how, are, how does addressing that issue come into this discussion? So I think at least part of that question is directed at me. On the first one, as I noted before, zoning is not the only type of land use regulation that exists so to deal with things like public health hazards and the like. You can deal with them more directly. Uh, in terms of other questions, it obviously depends on a particular issue, but in general, the kinds of zoning that really have uh, really increased uh, costs for housing do not contribute much to environmental quality. They may in some ways contribute to public transit of some kinds, but frankly, if the choice is either massively increase freedom and opportunity for millions of people or have a particular type of public transit, I think it's, there's a strong argument that the, if the public transit needs to be sacrificed, then let it be sacrificed in those instances. On the issue of home ownership here, I think uh, th there's sort of a little bit of a myth that exists in this country that you know, home ownership is the key to success and happiness and wealth, and for some people it clearly is, but I think we greatly overestimate it. Uh, a number of very successful countries, Switzerland is a great example, have home ownership rates far lower than ours by, there is, I think it's about 30% compared to about 60 to 65 for the US, mm -hmm. and while it is true uh, that for a lot of American households, a high percentage of their wealth is in the home, if they were renters, instead of spending a lot of money on a mortgage and paying off for 20 years like my wife and I are doing right now, they could have invested their money in other things. So I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing if more people end up renting and fewer uh, own homes. I think whether renting or owning is better uh, will vary from person to person in their situation. And what rent owning does have a downside, two downsides actually. One is a lot of your wealth is concentrated in this one asset. Most financial advisors will tell you diversification is a good thing. Second, uh, if the housing market falls a lot but you're still sitting on a big mortgage, that may itself impede your mobility, which happened to many people during the uh, housing market collapse from 2006 to uh, 2008. So uh, if by reducing zoning and increasing opportunity to win that way, we end up with a lower rate of home ownership, I don't think that would necessarily be a bad thing. If we, I'm not saying the U.S. should look exactly like Switzerland or anything like that, but if we <laughs> incrementally move in their direction, that wouldn't be so terrible. Uh, they're one of the most successful economies and societies in the world. I was going to say something really quick. I think it was a great question. I think it really spotlights the limits of uh, zoning in its in of itself being the solution. I you know I, I think it's an interesting. Um, uh, thought experiment because the, the problem is a lot of the the damage has been done from the zoning. So I come from you know the St. Louis area and there's this, the story of St. Louis County is the story of this sort of damage which happened as a result of zoning. We have over 90 municipalities in the county of St. Louis and uh, this allows for all sorts of ills including small municipalities like Ferguson. Sometimes they have three, 4,000 people in a so-called city with their own police department, their own fire department, and with these small police departments, we have 18,000 in the country now, with these small police departments, it's very hard to get a grip on some of the things like training and making sure you have quality. But the reason that you have these 
90 municipalities in Ferguson, and a part, in part it's a zoning story. In part, it's a story of developers uh, going out to the county, uh, trying to cater to white flight, uh, creating these subdivisions, and these subdivisions deciding that they are going to create their own municipalities so that they can uh, have zoning regulations that will keep others out. And so the, the damage was done in the 20th century with zoning as the tool. Now you can take away the tool of the zoning, sure, but the, the, the wealth has already been created, the, the 20th century has come and gone, and so if you're really gonna try to solve this problem and bridge the wealth gap, you've got, you have to do more than just rezone, and like you said, you have to create a mechanism for home ownership, and, or, or if there's another wealth creation mechanism that you can find, you have to affirmatively allow the government to get involved in that. And, and there's an understanding of the Fair Housing Act uh, when it was uh, first passed that it wasn't just about stopping discrimination at the point of sale or the point of lease. It was about trying to actively lessen segregation. And if the federal government was to take that sort of obligation seriously and invest in some of those solutions, then we might be able to bridge those gaps. Uh, my name is Jessica Westerman. I'm a current law clerk. Um, Richard, you hit on, and it sounds like a lot of your work focused on, uh, the, the problem with distinguishing between de facto and de jure segregation, um, by which I mean de facto segregation is rooted in de jure segregation, and I think that's pretty undeniable. I think everyone, at least here, would agree with that. Um, I'm not super familiar with the substantive law of housing discrimination. I'm more familiar with um, the school segregation integration context, but I know at least in that context, um, when we're talking about desegregation orders, um, they can only be put in place if you show evidence of prior de jure segregation. I imagine it's analogous in the housing context. Um, as a strategic matter, when you're litigating these things, um, do you think it's worth trying to make the argument that um, you know de facto segregation in most or all cases is rooted in de jure segregation? Or do you think that, um, you know, it's, it, if there's a way to just push the law further to say that, equal, in fact, it, the Equal Protection Clause requires um, eliminating or addressing de facto segregation as well as de jure segregation? Well, I, that's a good question. And I, I, um, I am willing because of where we are today and where we need to go, I'm willing to accept John Roberts' view, which personally I don't agree with, but I'm willing to accept John Roberts' view that there's a clear distinction between de facto and de jure segregation um, because his facts are wrong. Even if you accept his theory, his facts are wrong. And there's enough evidence of racially explicit government policy in creating residential segregation patterns uh, to put it in the jury side of his schism uh, without getting into the more philosophical issue of where the, uh, they, they blend together. Now, let me just say, say further that we're talking about, though, policies that occurred 40, 50 years ago, 60 years ago. So there is a legitimate question about um, how long does the impact of government policy uh, determine the constitutional violation. Um, and I think that in, you know, when we desegregated buses or lunch counters, uh, it's e easy to see how the next day you can have seg integration. You know, the next day you can sit anywhere you want on a bus, the next day you can um, go to any restaurant. But if you try to desegregate housing, the next day all the families that were segregated can't move to an integrated neighborhood. So it obviously takes much longer to remedy the jury segregation of housing than it does to remedy the jury segregation in other fields. How long? I don't think it's been long enough. And uh, you know, the example, I, you know, we, I talked earlier about Levittown. You know, Levittown and all the suburbs like that that were built in the late 1940s and 1950s, those homes sold for eight, nine, ten thousand dollars a piece. That's seventy-five thousand, a hundred thousand dollars in today's terms. The um, Today, those homes sell for three hundred, four hundred, five hundred thousand dollars. They were affordable to working class families, black or white, in the mid twentieth century. They're not affordable to working class families today. So the enormous wealth gap that's been referred to 
is a direct result of unconstitutional federal policy. So the fact that Levittown today, uh, and, and you can say the same thing of many of these suburbs, in a, in a metropolitan area that's 15% African American is less than 3% black today, is a direct result of unconstitutional federal policy. Now, I'm not a lawyer, all of you are, but I have less um, uh, confidence in litigation than you do. My interest in making this constitutional <laughs> argument is not that I think these things can be solved by litigation. I think they need to be solved in the court of public opinion first, and then by Congress. But if this history was understood, then the courts would have to ratify such policies, even if they were race conscious, in a way that they wouldn't ratify it if they believed it was de facto segregation. one in that in both cases, I think something like Richard's diagnosis of the problem very much applies. There was this history of massive government-sponsored discrimination which led to the situation we have today. But we also should be careful in saying for, uh, that given that history that, well, we can just have a, a similar massive government effort the other way and then things will be okay. The history of school busing in particular is highly instructive in that the busing was done with good intentions, but it often had bad effects. It was often uh, was much protested, not only by whites, but even by African-American parents. If we were to try to similarly socially engineer housing, I think we might have similar problems. So I would prefer, where possible, to instead break down barriers and let give people more mobility rather than having the government come out and say, we're going to have the housing equivalent of long-distance school busing of the kind that caused significant problems in the 70s and 80s, even though it was done with good intentions in most cases. Good questions. We are out of time. Darn it. Um, but uh, and I'm going to talk to him about his view on litigation before, before the end of the day. Talk to him, too. But would you guys join me in thanking them? Thank you very much.